Hey everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Joe Travellini. I'm a product manager on the Amazon Elasticash team. And joining me is Lindsay Berg of Groupon. And we're super excited to be presenting uh, this year's deep dive of Amazon Elasticash for Redis. During the session, Lindsay will review how Groupon uses Elasticash for Redis as a key part of serving their online business. So here's what we plan on going over today. I'll begin with a brief overview of AWS's database services and where Elasticash fits in. I'll then re uh, review some of the key capabilities and features of Elasticash with some technical examples. And that'll include going over some of our more recent launches you might not yet be familiar with. I'll then turn it over to Lindsay uh, to review how Groupon has adopted Elasticash, um, highlighting their migration to AWS, as well as diving deep on how they use Redis for curating deals. So let's jump in first with a quick review of Elasticash and where it fits in into the overall AWS database services landscape. Our philosophy at AWS when it comes to database services is to provide purpose-built solutions, meaning giving customers the right tool for the job. So in our database portfolio is everything from relational databases uh, to all varieties of non-relational stores for workloads that need things like document databases, time series, wide column, and so on. Elasticash is one of two of our in-memory database services, which are designed to uh, serve workloads with a super low latency and high throughput performance demands that only memory can provide. Elasticash itself comes in two flavors, one for Memcached and one for Redis. So in this session, we'll be focusing on Elasticash for Redis. And if I refer to just Elasticash in shorthand, generally it's Elasticash for Redis that we're referring to. So our aim is to make Elasticash the best place to run Redis anywhere, period. As the name implies, Elasticash for Redis is fully compatible with the open source distribution of Redis, which is a super popular in-memory key value store with a simple and powerful API <clears throat> and provides blazing fast performance. Redis is consistently voted the most loved data store by developers now for five years running by Stack Overflow. Elasticash is fully managed, meaning as a customer, you don't need to worry about keeping the lights on. Um, there's no hardware infrastructure to maintain. You don't need to handle installing Redis software. You don't need to configure a custom monitoring solution. We handle all that undifferentiated heavy lifting for you. Elasticash is highly available, so you can deploy in a clustered configuration um, with shards and replicas distributed across multiple availability zones. You can access your clusters across different AWS regions using our global data store capability. And just recently, we launched support for application auto-scaling so your clusters can scale in and out as your traffic demands change over time. Um, I'll go over an example of auto-scaling later in the session, as will Lindsay. We offer a number of security controls and compliance certifications so you can be confident running your Redis clusters in enterprise environments and for production workloads. So things like network isolation, encryption, resource-based access control, and access control lists. Um, Elasticash is a HIPAA-eligible service, and we've achieved a number of compliance certifications, like ISO, SOC, PCI DSS, FedRAMP, and more. And finally, Elasticash is scalable, giving you easy ways to scale your cluster nodes up or down while remaining online. You can scale your capacity to serve reads with cross-AZ replicas, writes with data partitions called shards, and you can scale up to 500 nodes in a single cluster. So why do we focus on providing the best place to run Redis? It's because our customers love using Redis and we wanna make it simple, super simple for them to do so. Redis is consistently rated among the top data stores in terms of its popularity and use. It has a large, vibrant open source community and it's used widely across many of the world's largest, most demanding web applications. Here are two assessments, one from DB Engines and the other from that Stack Overflow annual developer survey I just mentioned, which both rank Redis at the top of the list. Developers love Redis because it's blazing fast, it's super versatile, and it's easy to use. Its elegant API makes it easy to execute many common actions developers often find themselves needing to perform when building their apps. So here's a summary of the Redis data types and some of the commands associated with them. It makes it super simple to implement things like session stores, leaderboards, and geographic search. The fundamental data type in Redis is a string. Um, all Redis keys are of a string type, 
And string values can be used to store anything from HTML snippets to numbers. So some of these commands here are numeric in nature, like increment and decrement. So you can use strings as counters. The sorted set is another really cool feature of Redis. It allows you to enter um, values into the set in any order. Um, on the back end, it's guaranteed to be sorted and guaranteed that the items are unique. <clears throat> the, that makes it ideal for creating leaderboards. Um, they're also optimized for range queries, so you can fetch, say, positions 10 through 20 on your leaderboard with optimal speed. There are more complex data types, like streams, geospatial, which Groupon uses quite a bit for serving relevant deals to their customers, um, and hyperloglog, -log, which is an approximation technique for the count distinct problem. So now with a basic you know, understanding of the core capabilities of Redis in terms of the data storage and access, let's take a quick look at how it's used. So basically, you can think of Redis as a shared distributed in-memory store that supports thousands of concurrent client connections to any given node. When using uh, ElastiCache in cluster mode, you can partition your key space into shards, and each shard can support up to five read replicas across multiple AZs, allowing you to scale your storage and throughput. Each shard has a primary node which accepts writes, and this primary node broadcasts to its read replicas. In the event that any of the shard primaries fails, ElastiCache will automatically promote one of the read replicas to be the new primary, typically within a few seconds. And we'll then automatically kick off launching a replacement for the failed node, and that makes it really easy to build fault-tolerant, highly available applications. So let's say you have a client that's writing a new item to your cluster. Here it's writing a string with key A and value 1. And typically within one millisecond, any readers will see that updated A equals 1 value that was just written. So in effect, you have a shared memory experience accessible to thousands of clients, and it avoids the drawbacks of a single system that's limited to local memory. These properties, they enable microsecond latency and high throughput performance for all sorts of application use cases. And just about anything, in, uh, anything will benefit from the increased performance that ElastiCache provides. All right, so now I'm going to dig into some of our recent launches. Using auto-scaling, you can automatically add shards and replicas to your cluster when certain criteria are met. For example, when your traffic spikes and your cluster's under load. Also, if you choose, you can configure policies that automatically scale in by removing those extra shards and replicas once your traffic subsides. We offer predefined metrics that you can use for your auto-scaling policies, or you can craft your own custom metrics uh, using CloudWatch. I'll show you an example of how to register an auto-scaling policy with a custom metric in just a second. Uh, and with auto-scaling, you can also choose to perform your scaling activities on a set schedule. So that could be a good idea if your workload is predictable and regular, and you have a solid understanding of what your cluster topology needs are as a function of time. So I'm going to walk through an example here of a custom metric policy. So let's say you want to scale out your cluster by adding additional read replicas when you detect a period of high load. So auto-scaling policies are typically built with a JSON, so I've created a configuration file here, config.json. These files are relatively standard form. They require you to specify whether or not you want to use a predefined metric versus a custom metric, uh, what the name of the metric is, what namespace or service it pertains to, and so on. Here I've defined the policy that I want to kick in under certain conditions. So for one, I'm building a rule for the cluster called auto scaling demo, which is highlighted in blue. I'm keying off the engine CPU utilization metric in orange, but I'm also conditionalizing it to look only at the read replicas in the cluster shown in purple. That's because generally I expect the primary nodes all else equal to have higher CPU utilization because they're servicing writes, they're broadcasting you know, the updates to the replicas and so on. So here, when the average CPU utilization for all my replicas exceeds 50% on average, that's when this kicks in. So now that I have the config file, I need to register it with application autoscaling. To wire it all up, I need to register my cluster into what's called a scalable target in autoscaling. So basically, I'm letting autoscaling know that there's a resource it needs to be monitoring and making scaling decisions on. I do that with this first command, passing in parameters like ElastiCache being the service I'm interested in. The scaling dimension is comprised of my read replicas. The cluster I'm interested in, again, is named auto-scaling demo. And I set the minimum capacity to one and the maximum capacity to five. 
meaning that auto scaling will always make sure there's at least one replica available, but it won't attempt to launch more than five. <clears throat> Once the scalable target is created, I attach a policy to it by calling put scaling policy. I provide parameters like the name of the policy, specify its type, give it info about my scalable target. And that last parameter here is the configuration file that I just built. And that's it. Now I have an automatic scaling rule configured for this cluster. <clears throat> so a couple of best practices I want to share with respect to auto scaling. Um, first, when you're getting started especially, keep it simple. You don't want to try to combine multiple rules and multiple metrics to start. That could lead to unexpected behavior and it can be complex to debug. So we recommend starting using a single predefined metric and once you have a solid handle on it, you can use a custom metric if needed. Um, next, try to avoid whiplash. So if you configure a policy using thresholds that are too tight or aggressive, it can lead to unbalanced load ac across the cluster and an excess of scaling activity. So there's a couple of techniques you can take to mitigate that. Um, you could take advantage of the cooldown directives built into auto scaling, which limit how often um, a scaling activity can kick in after the prior one was performed. You can also disable automatic scaling in entirely and use manual scaling to scale in which will give you an opportunity to inspect, um, especially if the auto scaling kicked off in an unanticipated way. And finally, test. We recommend using at least four weeks of historical data to set your target values and your scaling rules. Okay, so another capability we just launched is data tiering, which I'll get into quite a bit here. So, so what is it really? Um, it's the ability to expand the available storage capacity in your clusters by automatically and transparently moving data between memory and locally attached NVMe solid state drives, or SSDs. So whenever the available memory capacity in your cluster is fully consumed, ElastiCache will begin to move items from memory to disk, effectively expanding the amount of cluster storage capacity available. The way we choose which data to move from memory to disk is by using a least recently used, or LRU, algorithm. In other words, when you're using a cluster with data tiering, ElastiCache monitors the last access time of every item it stores. When memory fills up, it chooses the item that was accessed least recently or the longest amount of time ago and moves it from memory to disk. So if your workload needs to retrieve an infrequently used item after it moves to disk, ElastiCache will first move it back to memory before serving the request. So really what this boils down to is giving customers a new price performance option for their Redis workloads. SSDs have slightly higher latencies when compared to memory, but also cost significantly less. So if you have an application that can tolerate a small amount of additional latency every so often, you know, the first time an infrequently accessed item is needed again, data tiering can provide compelling cost savings as your data sets grow. The sweet spot for data tiering is workloads where up to 20% of the data set is hot or accessed regularly, and the other 80% is warm or accessed infrequently. So if you're running at full capacity utilization, you know, fully consuming all the memory in your clusters, and in this case with data tiering, fully consuming all the storage and disk, you can save over 60% on your bill as compared to running fully in memory. To use data tiering, there are no application changes required, it's completely transparent to applications, and it's designed to have minimal performance impact with a focus on providing low latency. And we'll go over performance for data tiering in more depth in just a minute. So as of now, data tiering supported when using the Graviton 2-based R6GD node type. Right here on the, uh, on the right is an example of the largest node size, the R6GD 16x large. Across memory and disk, the 16x large has two terabytes of capacity. And again, if you scale up to 500 nodes in your cluster, you can now store up to one petabyte in a single Redis cluster. So here's a quick comparison between our data tiering node and its closest counterpart, the R6G. The way I like to think about the difference is that the D in R6GD stands for disk. And from a hardware perspective, I mean, that's really the only difference. Each data tiering node has about four times the disk capacity as memory, and that four to one ratio is where the 20% figure that I just talked about comes from. From a price perspective, data tiering nodes do cost more per hour relative to their non-tiering counterparts, because they include the custom, fully managed tiering software that we're providing in ElastiCache, and because they offer 4.8 times total capacity compared to the R6G. <clears throat> so when you think about pricing from a capacity perspective as opposed to a per node hour perspective, you can see that you're saving over 60% 
with just six tenths of a cent per gigabyte per hour when using data Terran, compared to 1.6 cents per gigabyte per hour running fully in memory. And to help you right size your cluster footprint, we offer data tiering nodes in sizes ranging from X large with 125 gigabytes of capacity per node at the low end, all the way up to the 16X large with two terabytes of capacity at the high end. Here's a summary of the node specs for R6GD with data tiering. Um, all this information is out on the public website, so I'm not gonna go through it all in depth. But one thing I wanted to highlight is that your effective price per gigabyte is consistent across node sizes. Again, at just six tenths of a cent per gigabyte per hour. So all these pricing examples uh, were in the U US East One region, and they're for on-demand nodes. You can actually save up to an additional 55% using reserved nodes. Today we offer our 6 gd uh, in nine AWS regions scattered all across the globe. So let's revisit how data tiering works, this time a level or two deeper. Um, earlier I mentioned how ElastiCache, when using tiering, you were tracking the last access time of every item stored. Um, to do this, we store some additional telemetry, and we're able to do that using an efficient, low overhead, 16 bytes per Redis key uh, in memory. So I mentioned that as something to keep in mind when you're planning your clusters, since each key will consume that extra 16 bytes of space. In terms of how the LRU algorithm functions, it works atomically at the item level, meaning all or nothing. So if you have one of those more complex Redis data structures, like a sorted set, um, any, data, any read or write to that item constitutes an access. So if you have a large sorted set, you haven't touched it in a while, um, it will likely move in its entirety from memory to disk. And in the future, if you have to fetch any portion of it, ElastiCache will move all of its content back from disk to memory. So something to keep in mind, because it can have latency implications, we recommend, recommend keeping an eye out for that, especially if you have large complex data structures that you expect to age off, but then subsequently need to access in the future. And keep in mind that extra latency is really only on the first time that you need to access uh, anything on disk. Once it gets paged back to memory, it's subject to the LRU uh, once again. Another thing to keep in mind is that the keys themselves are always stored in memory. So it's the values that ElastiCache tiers to disk. We do that to provide a consistent performance for lookups, uh, for key lookups, and for other metadata operations on keys. And finally, we perform asynchronous I.O. between the Redis engine and the tiering engine. So here we're optimizing overall for latency. So when you need to access an item on disk, you know, we're not blocking any accesses to items on memory. Uh, asynchronously, we're moving it back from disk to memory. We're not blocking the main thread, and we're allowing for concurrent access to the cluster with minimal overall uh, disruption to performance. So on performance, I just wanted to share some of the benchmarks we ran. Uh, we used the open source Redis benchmark program, um, ran it across five EC2 instances, 200 client connections, and let it bake in for a two week period. We executed the test against a single node R6GD 2x large. Uh, we loaded up almost 400 million unique keys. Um, each key was 16 bytes, and each value was a 500 byte string. We used a four to one read versus write ratio, and we curated the workload such that 10% of accesses at any given time were guaranteed to fetch items stored on disk. And we did that because we wanted to evaluate the impact when an infrequently accessed item needed to be accessed again. What we found overall is that the impact was minimal. So on the left, you can see the command latencies broken down by average, median, and the 90th, 95th, and 99th percentiles. In the 99th percentile, latency is just 1.4 milliseconds compared to 820 microseconds on average. Uh, the node was also able to sustain serving 240,000 transactions per second. So if you have an application with large capacity demands and can tolerate this performance pro profile, Data tiering is a cost-effective way uh, for you to scale as you grow. So hopefully at this point you're thinking about how you're going to get started and what workloads to kick the tires with. Um, so one thing we recommend doing in your testing and of course in production is monitoring with CloudWatch. So we've updated the metrics available for ElastiCache in a couple of different ways. <clears throat> First we introduced four new metrics. Um, their names here are pretty self-explanatory what they do. And in, in addition to that, we added a new metric dimension called tier for two pre-existing metrics, um, current items and bytes used for cache. 
So the tier metric dimension is completely optional, right? If you don't specify it, you simply query the metric like current items. It gives you the total irrespective of tier, just like it would today. Um, however, if you want to break down how many of your items are on memory versus disk, you can now do that. So note that these metrics are only valid for clusters with data tiering. Here's an example CloudWatch dashboard with the metrics. Um, you can see up on the top row how the memory plus disk uh, equals the total. Um, let's look at the metric on the bottom right here, uh, specifically num items read from disk. So um, in the event that you experience cl high client side latency, you might want to look at this metrics value. And you're going to compare it against perhaps something like total number of commands sent to the cluster. So you can use CloudWatch metric math to add up get type commands plus set type commands, compare it to this metric, number of items read from disk. If the proportion's too high, you can scale up or scale out your cluster to have additional memory capacity available to serve your hot data. Last but not least, um, just wanna highlight some of the limitations that, that exist so you can uh, be aware in your planning. So for one, uh, large item values, you know, ones greater than 128 megabytes are not eligible for tiering. So those will always be kept in memory and will never be tiered to disk. Um, next, the set of max memory policies that govern key eviction are limited to these three. No eviction, which effectively turns off key eviction, and one of the two LRU-based eviction policies, all keys LRU or volatile LRU. And I just wanna mention that the LRU that happens here, there's now two different types of LRU. There's the fully managed LRU that powers data tiering, moving um, items from memory to disk, and then there's the max memory policy, which the name is slightly misleading with data tiering because what we're really talking about is the behavior when all capacity, memory plus disk, is fully consumed. And again, you can use one of these LRU-based um, max memory policies. Finally, some of our cluster management features aren't yet supported with R6GD. Um, things like online migration of a self-managed Redis cluster or rescaling a cluster from a node type other than R6GD into a data tiering cluster. Um, is not supported at launch. So what we recommend for migrating an existing cluster is restoring from a backup. And while auto scaling is not yet supported with R6GD, manually rescaling up, uh, up or out is supported. So just summing things up, super excited to make data tiering available. Um, again, it's all about cost effectively scaling to large amounts of capacity. It's ideal for applications accessing up to 20% of their data set regularly, completely transparent to applications, minimal performance impact and available today in nine AWS regions. So as an example of how data tiering allows for this cost-effective scaling and growth, here's a quote from one of our customers, Corey Bertram, the Chief Technology Officer at Rocked, which is a leading e-commerce marketing technology company. He said that Elasticash allows Rock to handle our data sets hyper growth without impacting user experience. Data tiering was perfect for us as we can store five times the data per node with virtually unnoticeable impact. So that wraps up what I wanted to cover. Um, we're looking forward to seeing how our new, new customers and existing customers adopt these enhancements. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lindsay to share Groupon's journey. Thanks, Joe. Uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm a software engineer at Groupon. I work within the platform engineering team and I'm part of a subunit that supports data infrastructure in several forms. I'm obviously here to talk about our experience with Elasticash. Redis and Groupon are about the same age. Uh, both are a little more than a decade old. We've been using Redis at Groupon in some form for much of the company's lifespan. Uh, we've grown together and it has a prominent seat at the table with us. In case you're not familiar with Groupon, I'd like to briefly introduce you to our business, just enough to put everything in context today. Groupon is an experiences marketplace where consumers discover fun things to do and local businesses thrive. So in case it's not obvious, uh, those are marketing words, not mine. So let me restate this in my own words. We are a tech first company. We have a mutual interest in supporting local businesses and we provide a rich set of tools to help local merchants. We also facilitate connections and experiences with customers themselves. So the takeaway here is that what you see when you go to our site or our mobile app, uh, that's only a very small part of the picture. There is a huge infrastructure behind the scenes supporting this. Uh, so let's talk about our technology ecosystem or our uh, landscape. Our stack is varied and our service owners have a reasonable amount of flexibility to choose tools that best meet their needs. We support a wide array of both paid and open source tools. We are microservices heavy with over 600 services in production today. Our data volumes are in the terabytes 
And it's probably pretty easy to summarize my next statement, which is that we are very API heavy and data driven. Uh, we support millions of requests per second, and we have requirements for sub millisecond response times. So when I started internalizing, internally socializing the idea of co-leading a breakout session about Elasticash at reInvent, we got a lot of tangential feedback about conferences in general. And one of the louder themes was that practical discussions that talk about real world applications or complex projects like migrations were memorable and engaging. Uh, so I will start today by talking about our larger migration journey that we're in the middle of. Uh, we'll then go into detail about why we use Redis at Groupon and why Elasticash is the right solution for us. We'll also mention a few stumbles that we recovered from along the way, and we'll finally wrap up by talking about what's next for us. Uh, so like I said, we are in the middle of a company-wide migration from on-prem to AWS. Everything, and, and I do mean everything, is migrating away from our data centers. Uh, it's an overwhelmingly large effort with significant infrastructure changes. Uh, and to state the obvious, even the services that have no business or functional changes, they still need to shift on the new infrastructure. So I thought it might be interesting to look at our timeline. It's a very long endeavor. It's the largest project I've ever been on. Uh, we started planning back in 2017. Our first infrastructure pieces were in place in early 2018. And then later that year, our first service was migrated. So today, most of our customer impacting services live in AWS, and that's about 50% of our services. Uh, that 50% number is also a little bit deceptive. Uh, we've known from the very beginning that our target exit, exit date from the data centers would be 2023. We do have services uh, that were re-architected to take advantage of updated tech, and we have some services that we'll just abandon. Uh, so we are very, very close to the finishing line, and we only have one year left. So let's get into the details about why we're using Redis. Uh, Let's first step back in time, though, for a moment, because as I mentioned earlier, we are microservices heavy, and we give a lot of flexibility to our engineering teams. We also operate primarily with using a DevOps model where each team owns everything, including support. And back in the day, this also included everything from the OS on up and the entire stack in many cases. Uh, so we had a lot of variation in our data and caching strategies. Our caching strategy at the time was also very front end heavy, using a lot of varnish. Um, and over time, our customer base grew, our feature set grew, and our traffic set grew. So as we emerged from our startup days, we recognized that we had a different set of needs. We saw the value and benefits of specialization, standardization, and centralization. We also needed to be more resilient, and that meant for us uh, we needed failover and replication between data centers. And we also needed to maximize our query per second performance. Uh, and Redis offers sharding, sharding at the time, um, they still do, uh, to allow us to scale horizontally. So all of this led to the decision to change to a managed service model. And Redis uh, was our go-to for this. So our first in-house um, managed Redis service uh, was live in 2017. So fast forward to today, about 20% of our 600 services use Redis in some way. Uh, common uses are caching, message brokering, and system configuration. Uh, some of the instances warm themselves. Some have a very short TTL. Some have completely static content that's refreshed periodically. And, and some are even using Redis in kind of a semi-persistent data store um, strictly to support the sub-millisecond response times. Um, so we can very we can very easily sum up why we're using Elasticash in three words, and those words are cost, visibility, and control. So let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, so first, focusing on cost. So prior to Elasticash, we were paying an annual subscription fee that was based on predicted usage, and it's already hard enough to forecast anything in a modern tech company where change is the only guarantee. Um, and so on top of that, uh, we were in the middle of this overall migration from on-prem to AWS. And it was just so extremely difficult for us to predict our usage that we ended up leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, and now that we get to pay for what we use, it's a pretty dramatic cost savings for us. Uh, focusing on monitoring, um, and uh, we're going to drill in on tagging in particularly because the tagging that's offered through AWS is a huge win for us. Before we uh, did had really no easy way to break down cost by service, we were operating in the blind on a granular level. Uh, we couldn't show the cost to the service owner to help guide their planning and architecture decisions, and the platform providers also could not optimize existing databases for cost savings. Um, scaling is an another really big thing for us. Auto scaling in particular uh, is going to help us optimize our spend. So in the future, we'll use information to be smarter about our usage. We are actively beta testing auto scaling right now. 
And a side note that you'll see in a moment, we only completed our migration, our full migration two months ago. So two months in, we have enough data that we're already able to uh, take advantage of this and start to realize some of that cost savings. Um, and so this is a little bit of an unusual one to talk about in tech. It's the quality of life. Uh, we don't really spend much time talking about this. We're very, very metric focused. So we will highlight things like cost and performance, um, but behind the scenes, the work is still um, created by people. All, um, so uh, some of the most memorable experiences in a bad way for the folks managing the Redis service on-prem, they were all centered around hardware and networking issues, and these were very insidious issues to troubleshoot. Uh, and some of our engineers still have memories of issues that took days to find root cause. Um, so our platform engineers are now experiencing a much lower volume of pages uh, for our Redis databases. These less pages, it reduces the risk of burnout, which reduces the risk of employee turnover, and it increases the chance that critical domain knowledge will stay in-house longer. So, I mean, sa saving money is important, but um, improving someone's quality of life is a very compelling perk that we don't get very often. So. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is update control, upgrade, upgrade control, excuse me. Uh, our old subscription model required us to upgrade the entire Redis platform every year, and it forced this upgrade upon every service. So we spent an entire resource month uh, doing this every year. It required an abundance of planning and orchestrating with all the service owners, and it was a higher risk for us because it was an all or nothing. Um, so now we've taken back control in two ways. Uh, we get to upgrade the service uh, one at a time. Uh, it's not an all or nothing, and we can do it when it's right for us. Um, so the last thing, so a, a well-rounded evaluation of any solution includes both positive gains and potential costs incurred to make that change. And an infrastructure change is, is a huge commitment. So we wanted to be confident in our decision. Uh, and without this analysis, uh, it would have been there would have been a room for doubt about our choice. So I think it's fair to be open and share some of the less obvious costs that we looked at prior to making our final decision. Uh, they won't be the same for everyone, but this is what was important to us and these are the choices that we made. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is a temporary increase in latency. So if you remember, um, we're in the middle of migration, uh, so some of our services are still on-prem and it was really important for us to understand what latency we may incur by hosting these in different places. Um, before when everything was uh, commingled in the same data center, uh, the only latency we had was internally and it was just due to basic uh, hardware limitations. Um, so uh, through some testing, uh, the latency was very easily mitigated for us though um, by just choosing the closest availability zone to our data centers. And we'll experience this minor increase in latency for about the next year. Uh, so let's talk about cluster aware clients. Uh, so we uh, were using a smart proxy provided by the subscription service. This was very convenient for our application engineers as in many cases, they didn't have to be aware if they were calling a cluster or just a standalone instance, the middleware took care of this for them. So since we're no longer using that subscription service, we needed to change all of our clients that connect to clusters uh, to use a cluster aware library. Uh, this was very easily mitigated through planning, communicating early, creating solid documentation, and providing good customer support. Um, and engineers in general, we're not really very famous for our, our good communication skills. Uh, and I was very impressed internally with the organization and the, clear, and the clear directions that our engineers gave out. They made this very easy for all of our service owners. Um, so some service owners did need to retrofit their clients. And we're going to actually look at a couple examples of this in a moment. And then there's a second bonus I just want to mention here. Um, when we're, by using the smarter cluster aware clients, we were actually eliminating the middle, middleware and we reduced the number of network hops. So one of our larger services had already taken advantage of this prior to the migration. So we had a proof of concept that there was a real gain in performance distinguishing between these two, uh, between the, uh, the, the standalone and the uh, smart proxy. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is kind of focused on cost analysis. And internally, we were using this term, uh, small instance cost penalty. So before the migration, some clusters were multi-tenant. Uh, and now on Elasticash, every service has its own cluster. So this concept of multi-tenancy goes away. So here we're basically comparing the cost of purchasing in bulk versus individually to understand the delta between the two. Uh, we'll walk through an example of how we quantified this cost. So we started by comparing the cost 
per year gigabit for the largest and smallest instances. Uh, in total, our multi-tenant clusters used uh, just a little bit over a terabyte of data. And the largest node size at the time supported a 300 uh, gig um, memory storage. So uh, we need, would have needed four of those to cover that amount of data. Uh, and then the second part, uh, we calculated the expected cost if all these clusters were individual. Uh, we made assumptions. Uh, we made a few assumptions. We did not factor in the CPU because most of the databases were not pegged by the CPU in any way. Um, we also strictly looked at the cost uh, per gigabit year. We assumed replication and we started with the actual database size. Uh, one by one, we then matched up each database to the smallest instance type that supported the memory footprint uh, with another 35% capacity room for growth. And we also had to double that for replication. So the estimated cost, uh, some cost of these instances was around 120,000 years uh, if they were all on their own. Um, so the delta ended up being about 30,000 a year. The, the good news for this is that that delta, that extra 30 grand, was way less than the cost of our subscription. So it was pretty nominal for us. We moved on past this afterwards. Uh, so let's just look at the Elastic Cache migration a little bit. Uh, this is overlaid on top of our overall mi migration. They both have the same flow and phases, but I thought it was interesting to see how they lined up. Uh, so in mid-2018, we started comparing options and estimating costs. And this was right around the same time when we uh, stood up our first bit of infrastructure in general in AWS. Uh, and then in early 2019, we finalized our pro proposal and we chose Elastic Cache as, as the solution. We waited all the way until the end of last year, Q4 of 2020, uh, and when we actually stood up the platform itself uh, and put the migration plan in, in place. And then the next quarter, so the first quarter of 2021, uh, we began all of our customer engagement and all of our provisioning. And then by the end of Q2, every single Redis instance was migrated. So all in all, this was a very smooth migration for us. Uh, I'm, dare I say, I would use the word unremarkable, which is like a really positive thing in any sort of a migration. Um, it, it was amazing. So in most cases, the caches warm themselves. No engineering effort was needed. Uh, it was usually just a config change uh, when the cache was ready. Uh, downstream services office often didn't even know that the change had occurred. Um, and there's a really strong emphasis that this was the majority of cases for us. So we migrated a total of 127 caches. We decommed another 51 caches. We did this all in two quarters. And on top of all this, we did all this effort with two part-time engineers. It was a pretty amazing feat for them. Uh, so let's switch gears a little bit and just talk about how uh, Redis provides a better user experience for us, for our customers. So one way to enhance the experience uh, is to make sure that we provide relevant and interesting offers to the customer. And when I say relevant, I mean deals that are close to them, deals that are in their price range, deals that match their interests, and deals that are fresh. So in the last part of the talk today, we're going to focus on the migration journey for one of our backend platforms, which plays a key role in facilitating a better user experience by aiding the display of the relevant deals to the customers in real time. And here, the emphasis here is on relevant and real time. Uh, so we're going to talk about Watson. Uh, Watson is a key part of our data science platform, and it's a key piece that feeds into our search and relevance platform. It's an interesting use case, not so much because of how it's using Redis, but instead because one, it's been around in some form for a very, very long time, and it's accumulated a lot of tech debt. So it was a little bit more complicated uh, to migrate. And two, it's one of the first services that is already realizing cost savings as a result of tagging and auto-scaling. Uh, so I just want to give you a really quick glimpse at the high-level architect architecture. This is a very busy diagram. So the key takeaway here is just like how extremely data heavy it is and the large number of Redis caches that drive the performant API that serves the real-time data. Redis is the only solution that met this performance requirements here and the prior version without Redis was not able to provide real, any sort of real-time results. It was a big win for us. Uh, there were 14 logical Redis, di da Redis databases. Um, most were migrated and they had a variety of needs. So let's just walk through a few examples of those needs. Um, so one example would be uh, something with very high traffic. So in this case, you can see that uh, this Redis cache required two gigs per second in, 25 megs out. It also had a 28 gig um, memory footprint. So we chose to choose five of the R6G larges. 
Another example is very high memory needs. This one was consistently um, very close to a terabyte. So we actually chose 36 nodes of the R6G 2X large. Um, okay, so then we'll, let's switch gears and talk about the cutover uh, constraints. Uh, we're going to talk about one in particular. This wasn't our largest database, but it did have a high number of shards. It had about 400 million keys, and the TTL on the data here was one year. So our constraints um, included things like no data loss. Uh, the on-prem instances had to continue to be available for reads during the migration. We had to minimize the amount of time that writes to the database were paused so that we could minimize the chance that sealed data would be presented to the user. Um, so we were aiming to do all this in a two-hour time frame. Um, and the, the last thing really just to mention is that it required tight coordination between the platform engineers and the service owners. Okay, so let's talk about our cutover tools themselves. On our first benchmarking attempt to copy the data, uh, it took more than six hours to complete. This prompted us to look at other solutions and we ended, landed on a custom solution that maximized downtime to be less than an hour and it adhered to all of our other constraints we mentioned earlier. The final solution was a mix of tools wrapped in a bash script. Uh, we used command line tools provided by Redis, and we also used a Python package called RDB Tools, which is a parser for Redis VB dump files. We mainly use this in our context to process and rearrange the DB backups from shards to cluster slots. The last key element was a spare CentOS host in our data center. Emphasis on the location. Residing in the data center uh, with the Redis instances was critical. We had to process the DB backups before we could load them into ElastiCache, and we dramatically reduced the processing time by reducing network latency. Uh, this is how we actually brought the time down from eight hours to two. So let's look at the process itself and the key details. So we first paused all the writes to the on-prem Redis database. Once we started the migration process, any writes would have been lost, so they had to stay queued behind the scenes. We then dumped all the shards to flat files using Redis command line tools. We did this in parallel and uh, reduced the time down to two minutes for this step. And then the majority of our time was spent on step three, and this was rearranging the shards to the cluster slots. Here we used the Python utility to stream the dump files in Redis protocol and do a mass insertion, insertion into temporary Redis nodes that were pre-configured. The pre-configured nodes intelligently split the keys across the cluster slot bots, and we then created backups of the newly arranged data in the cluster slots. So in total, we were able to copy 500 gigs of data, including almost 4 million keys in 42 minutes. Using the same strategy, we finalized the database dumps and streamed them via, again via mass insertion into the final ElastiCache destination. We were able then to turn traffic back on um, and so point everyone to the new uh, cloud uh, Redis databases and we were able to resume all the writes uh, to the databases as well. So if you recall a few slide ago, slides ago, I mentioned the cluster aware clients. Our service owners now needed to be aware of the type of Redis database they were connected to. You know, was it a cluster or was it a standalone? So some minor code changes were necessary. Internally, our uh, Java apps most commonly use either, either Jetis or Lettuce to communicate to their Redis instances. Um, Jetis is simpler to use, it's faster, it's smaller, but it only supports the synchronous calls. Lettuce um, instead supports asynchronous, uh, it's also thread safe, and it has transparent reconnection handling. So all in all, uh, the connecting to the client is pretty straightforward, um, and they both connect to the master. If you look at the code itself, it's very, it's very similar. There's just a few more lines for the lettuce code. Um, and the, the key thing here is actually to notice that the connection strings um, for Jetis is a new Jetis. For lettuce, um, it's, a, it's also a non-cluster uh, starting API. And uh, let's uh, look at how the cluster connection would, would have been set up. Uh, and if you look at the lettuce, the package change is the only thing. It has the word cluster in it. Uh, so, and the Jetis as well. It uses Jetis cluster versus just Jetis. Um, so the last thing we're going to talk about is auto-scaling candidates. Uh, Watson is one of the very first Redis databases that we're beta testing for auto-scaling. So let's back up for a second and talk about how we decided that this instance was our first case. Uh, we started by looking at the most expensive clusters uh, that were using 40% of their memory. 
we narrowed this list down to 13 candidates. Um, and then we started to narrow the list even further using exclusion criteria. So services with frequent CPU spikes, despite the low memory uses, were not candidates for auto scaling because we would risk paying the CPU. Services with fluctuations in memory that would not benefit from the initial ramp up time, basically it meant that fluctuation was like too fast or too slow. Um, they were also excluded for this initial test. And finally, services that would risk maxing out the network throughput uh, were excluded as well. So our first candidate was Watson. Um, the particular database we chose had 36 nodes of the R6G2X large. Uh, we had given it an option to have up to 1.4 terabytes of data, but we were only using a third of it, just a little bit under, than four, under 400 gigs. Uh, so the next thing we had to do was identify what our specific scaling policy would be. So the first dimension we looked at was the CPU. In the month of October, we saw a spike of 7%, uh, and that was a spread across 36 nodes. So we did a little bit of math, and uh, if we had only been running this on one node, it would have spiked up to about 250% of the CPU. We wanted to max out the cap at 25% during these spikes, so we decided a minimum set of 10 nodes was appropriate for us. The next dimension we looked at was fluctuations in size, and this was like a check basically. We looked for the sharpest and longest memory growth. So in one day we went through from 315 gigs to 440, the difference was about 150. We also knew that adding each node would give us another 40 gigs in capacity. So that day we would have added three nodes, which is well under the um, one node per hour rate. So this was appropriate for us. The very last thing we did was look at network traffic. Uh, this chart shows a peak at 1.5 gigabits per second. This is across all nodes. One node can very easily handle this, so we weren't concerned about it at all. So our final setting um, for the uh, Watson Auto scaling policy uh, was to choose a minimum of 10 nodes and a maximum of 36 nodes. Uh, and we hadn't and then we estimated the cost savings, not on the 10, the minimum, but on 12, which is where we thought we were going to land. And we uh, calculated about a 14,000 uh, per month saving. So this is in production right now. And so far, so good. Um, we'll have more information later. Um, so just to wrap this all up here with the takeaways, our migration is complete. It was smooth. Uh, we did it on an extremely tight schedule. And, and we're very happy with our choice at this point. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the day. Thank you all for your time. I hope this was useful.